In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Just under 20 years ago, I moved to New York City. And this was a long-standing dream that started when I first came here on a trip in high school. I grew up in a rather homogeneous, mid-sized town in the West, and among the many things appealing to me about New York City was, is its diversity. Growing up where the vast majority of people look like you, speak like you, and believe like you, can frankly leave one wanting. So in these nearly 20 years, I've continued to find delight in the blessed diversity that is New York City. And indeed, I've learned a great deal, small things and large things. Now, when visiting my family in Colorado, and I ask if we can stop by a bodega, the response is, a what? I remember teaching my family and friends what schlepping means, that it can be taking oneself or a thing or a group of things from one place to another. My mother still can't quite comprehend how you can be referring to your person and a sack of groceries and schlepping both, but we're getting there. She's now at least using the word. Then there are some other lessons I learned. One such incident struck, struck with me even though at the time, my naivete and ignorance, quite frankly, were a little embarrassing. After having lived here for a couple of years, a friend and a colleague asked if I would mind watching her cat while she was away. Being the crazy cat person I am, I agreed to watch the cat. Now, my friend lives in a large apartment complex on the Lower East Side. The complex is home to a substantial Orthodox Jewish community. So on that Friday that she left, I left work. I went to my friend's apartment, took care of the cat, decided I would venture out in search of something for dinner. Later that evening, my friend called to see how Stanley, that's the cat, and I were getting along. And I assured her that all was well. We were doing great. I then proceeded to inform her, though, that something was not working properly with the elevators in the building. She asked what the problem was, and I said, well, I've taken two trips out this evening, and both times the elevator stops at every floor, and there's no one else in it. It's like a kid must have gotten in and punched every button. She burst out laughing and said, haven't you ever been in a Shabbos elevator? Thankfully, I knew what Shabbos was, but I had never encountered a pre-programmed Shabbos elevator. And to this day, usually at parties with a large audience, my friend delights in telling this story at every opportunity. But clearly, there are issues of more import that I've learned since living in New York. From that moment, that I really understood about the Shabbos elevator and what that meant and its significance to the Jewish Sabbath. I became interested, intrigued, by Jewish customs surrounding Shabbos, or Sabbath, as we Christians know it. In Mark's Gospel today, we hear the Pharisees confronting Jesus for breaking the tradition, as they saw, of the Sabbath. We see the glaring difference in the Pharisees who attempt to enforce the rigid letter of the law while completely missing the spirit of the law. Another example where all too often in Scripture, be they the Pharisees or occasionally, actually more than occasionally, often Jesus' own disciples, they tend to take Jesus either too literally or they miss altogether the sense of the spirit intended in the Jewish law in the way in which Jesus is interpreting it. Jesus counters the Pharisees by explaining that even on the Sabbath, people must eat. They were hungry. Similarly, the acts of healing and the restoration of wholeness 
are not to be shelved because they somehow violate the Sabbath. If we stop and think about the Sabbath, one might argue that healing actually elevates and in many ways satisfies the Sabbath. Jesus reminds them that the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. Clearly, God's intentions for the Sabbath are for healing, <clears throat> for restoration, renewal, and for life-giving rest and relationship. Which leads me to contemplate how we see the Sabbath living in this world so vastly different than first century Palestine. Some of us, as they say, of a certain age, recall when Sunday, while it was not forbidden to engage in activity, it was set apart as a distinct day, a day different than the other six days. Families often had large dinners after church, and then an afternoon of either leisure or recreation followed. So Sundays were different, and they were special. I'm not sure at what point this seemed to shift. Perhaps it was with the rapid rise of a 24-hour world in which we find ourselves living now. That followed shortly thereafter by a digitalized world that seemed all-consuming. <coughs> The pace and the rhythm in which we now live somehow doesn't seem to work in a complementary way with the notion of Sabbath. But I would ask, does that make Sabbath any less important? Now, I often prepare to cringe when I hear people say, well, back in the good old days, particularly given that the good old days were often anything but good for too many. There was far greater inequity in the world. The culture was infected with racism, sexism, and homophobia. And yes, we still have miles to journey to right those wrongs. But given that, I, as perhaps many, still long for a day when Sabbath was actually honored in a way that was intended. It was rejuvenating and reinvigorating. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. I started off talking about my curiosity with Jewish customs and beliefs about Shabbos. I live in Washington Heights on a street with a yeshiva and several synagogues. And I often observed Jewish couples, families, and individuals carrying crocks and pans of prepared food to the various apartment buildings on Friday evenings to share Shabbos with their friends and extended families. On the streets and in the stores, you can hear the greeting, Good Shabbos. There's a part of me that longs for that, to be a Christian tradition, to yet again inherit a custom from our Jewish brothers and sisters. The honor they exhibit towards the Sabbath, I believe, is something worth emulating. But when I think of the realities of that kind of devotion and determination and resolve, I wonder if this once hallowed element of Sabbath can be feasible in this world, one that is not set apart in some way. But the centrality of the Sabbath should at least be a conversation that we continue to have in the church. And I certainly realize that by addressing this crowd here this morning gathered in the cathedral, I'm preaching very much so to the converted because we're all here, and this is a part of our Sabbath celebration. But I'd love to have a robust conversation about the role Sabbath plays in our lives and in our history. In the field of mental health and among clergy, we talk a great deal about self-care, and how incredibly essential it is to take good care of oneself. Because if we don't, how can we be available for empathy, be a meaningful presence, and minister if our reservoirs are empty? That need for a reservoir is not unique to those just in helping professions, but to all of us as ministers in the church. <clears throat> 
It's something we all need in order to be present in the world and to honor our temple bodies with ample rest and reflection. The Sabbath is God's permission, God's commandment actually, to stop and rest and live and breathe deeply and intensely and take good care. It is a gift. The original commandment to the Israelites who had been slaves in Egypt and were forced to work day after day with no break, no rest, no Sabbath. And so God offers them this gift of Sabbath. Perhaps it is that history that compels and inspires the Orthodox Jewish people to so faithfully keep the Shabbos holy. Clearly, we are not, nor were we, slaves to the ancient Egyptian overlords, but we can be incarcerated by our own attainment, our labor and our endeavors, and yet still God's there, offering Sabbath. Yet we are seemingly tethered to technology that does seem to run our lives, particularly those thin, rectangular things we all hold and carry and look at as though encased in those gadgets rest all the mysteries of life. Yes, our phones. I am saying that to myself as much as to anyone. I don't want to untether. If I'm away from my phone for more than an hour, I start having withdrawal. But that's the problem. God might be calling us to untether sometimes. Can we spend at least a fraction of our time in an intentional rest? Solitude and prayer are two of the best places to start with keeping Sabbath. We are told that Jesus went off by himself and prayed. So I think the question is, how can we carve out a small part of our busy lives to rest, to rest and be in communion with God? Can we make room for Sabbath in our full and noisy and busy lives? While this might feel like just another thing to do, another task, it is actually the opposite. It's freeing us from tasks and responsibility, even if just for moments. The determination of establishing a rhythm is up to each of us. That's the great thing. We can figure that out for ourselves. What will work for each of us? We can decide. Shortly before I was ordained, my spiritual director, a lovely yet stern Roman Catholic nun, suggested, well, actually, it was more like a command, that I attend a silent weekend retreat. Now nothing, and I mean nothing, strikes terror in the heart of an extrovert than the thought of spending an entire weekend surrounded by people, yet unable to talk. I made up every excuse in the world as to why I could not do this retreat. It just wouldn't be possible. But Sister Rose wasn't having it. And so I went, and I actually loved it. Every single moment of the retreat. When we go, as many of us here from the cathedral do, on occasion to Holy Cross, that beloved place for so many of us, the Benedictine rule of observed silence at points throughout the 24-hour period is truly a blessing. So it is as we each look to add some observance of the Sabbath to our lives, we will find respite in what might initially feel like a scary unplugging from all things that we erroneously believe keep us going. But restocking a reservoir with health and wholeness will keep us going much longer, keep us able to be there for ourselves and for those we love and serve. A quiet rest that God wants for each of us, a process of restoration. Let us meet God anew on Shabbos, and on every single day. Lastly, long before the invitation to preach at the royal wedding, our presiding bishop Michael Curry, along with Jim Wallace, an evangelical leader and president and founder of Sojourners Magazine, 
planned an event that took place a week ago. It started with an ecumenical service in Washington, D.C., followed by a candlelight procession and pilgrimage to the White House. This event was called Reclaiming Jesus. Its confessional statement says, we believe two things are at stake, the soul of the nation and the integrity of faith. It is time to be followers of Jesus before anything else. Nationality, political party, race, ethnicity, gender, geography. Our identity in Christ precedes every other identity." End quote. And the good news is that our Sabbath, that great gift, can leave us renewed, refreshed, sated, and ready to start, as Bishop Curry so eloquently led in reclaiming Jesus. Amen.